On this Monday night, the high stakes meeting between the leaders of Russia and China. Two old friends catch up face to face. China basically has managed to have its cake and eat it too. Where the no limits partnership between two authoritarian leaders could lead. Collaborating to calm financial fears, what's being done to boost confidence in banks and why it's not 2008 all over again. Time is running out. Humanity is on thin ice and that ice is melting fast. A final warning and a glimmer of hope from UN climate scientists. And pro hockey powering forward. Also as a kid, I knew I was queer, but I was too afraid to say anything. The league's long journey to inclusion. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin in Moscow and that closely watched meeting between two authoritarian leaders. Chinese President Xi Jinping is making his first visit to Russia since the full-scale war in Ukraine began. He once called the Russian President Vladimir Putin his best friend. And the two have much in common. Both embrace the idea of a multipolar world where the U.S. is no longer dominant. And both dismiss democracy, effectively appointing themselves presidents for life. They're expected to sign an agreement deepening their partnership. In our top story tonight, Crystal Gamansing looks at what that might mean. Russia was the first country Xi Jinping visited after coming to power. Xi is now back meeting with the man he calls his dear friend. The visit comes as Xi is riding a diplomatic high. China helped to mend a long-standing rift between Saudi Arabia and Iran. But Russia is a different story. In the eyes of the West, Vladimir Putin is an international criminal. But Xi's visit proves he's not a pariah to all. Both countries uphold an independent foreign policy and see our relationship as a very high priority in our diplomacy. Words penned by Xi and published in Russian state media. So far, China basically has managed to have its cake and eat it too. They're buying cheap Russian food and oil. They're maintaining their trade with most of the rest of us. Russia is now the largest provider of oil to China, and China is the largest partner for EU imports. China has not condemned Russia for its war on Ukraine. It has floated a peace plan and Putin says they'll discuss it. But it's the question of China supplying lethal weapons to Russia that's of critical interest to observers. Putin lavished praise on Xi saying, we're jealous of China's colossal leap in development. On Sunday, the American National Security Council spokesman called Russia and China disruptors. Two countries that are chafing against this international rules-based order. Foreign policy expert Michael Hanlon, however, is not ready to write off the meeting just yet. If President Xi is more inclined to reinforce his commitment to the territorial sovereignty of all countries, the non-use of nuclear weapons, that could be taken as gentle rebukes against Russia. There are calls for Xi to speak with Vladimir Zelensky so that he can get the Ukrainian perspective. On the topic of China possibly providing weapons to Russia, Xi says that's an example of the West fanning the flames of war. Donna? All right, Crystal Gamansing in London, thanks. There is news tonight about another uncertainty on the horizon, how the world grapples with climate change. We're already living with the impact of extreme weather, floods, heat waves, and ferocious storms. Well, today, climate scientists delivered a final warning, saying we must massively fast-track efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The reality is we... At all levels, governments, communities, individuals have made climate change somebody else's problem. We have to stop that. We have to act now. Eric Sorensen lays out the science in this final report and where it offers some hope. It is essentially a final warning from the UN. A potentially catastrophic threshold for global warming will be crossed in the next decade. The signs are everywhere. Greenhouse gases are increasing, air and ocean temperatures climbing, glaciers are melting and sea levels rising. There will be more flooding and more droughts. Humanity is on thin ice and that ice is melting fast. In short, our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, 
all at once. In the 1970s, global temperatures annually were a blend, slightly above and slightly below average. The blue was cooler than average. Fast forward to the last decade. Hardly any blue at all. Temperatures almost everywhere have been above the historic average, especially in the Arctic. The rate of rising temperatures these last 50 years is the highest in the last 2,000 years. Temperatures are now 1.1 degrees Celsius higher than pre-industrial levels. And the goal of no more than a 1.5 degree rise will be reached by the early 2030s, if not sooner. The rest of this decade is key. The rest of this decade is whether we can apply the brakes and stop the warming at that level. The UN report calls on the most polluting nations to speed up the changes needed, shut down coal production, curb other fossil fuel use, and shift more quickly to low carbon energy. Canada is at the center of the debate, a major producer of fossil fuels and a steward of one of the longest stretches of the environmentally sensitive Arctic. The Canadian government has committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. But the UN has moved that timetable forward to as close as possible to 2040. For Canada, that's a challenge. It's one thing to, to simply say, well, you know, we want to reach this goal, but we have to give ourselves the, mean, the means to get there. And we, we do that now in Canada for 2050. We will obviously need to, to, to take a, a second long, hard look at what the IPCC is proposing for 2040. Critics say this country must do more. Canada needs to finally address the elef elephant in the climate policy room, which is the continued expansion of oil and gas production. In spite of the dire outlook, the UN report says it's not too late to limit the harm from climate change, but we must act now. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. In a pre-budget speech today, Canada's finance minister, Christia Freeland, promised targeted inflation relief is coming for Canadians. She also did her best to quell fears about global financial turmoil, saying Canada's banks are on solid ground. Our financial institutions have the capital they need to weather periods of turbulence. A hallmark of our Canadian banks is prudent risk management. And this is also a core principle for those of us who regulate the financial system. There was coordinated action over the weekend to address fears about the stability of the financial system. The Swiss bank UBS has cut a deal to buy its arch rival Credit Suisse, which was faltering. What depositors and investors want to know is whether there's another shoe to drop. Our senior business correspondent Ann Gaviola reports. The world's central banks don't normally have to act as first responders. These actions are instrumental for restoring orderly market conditions and ensuring financial stability. But in a rare display of global coordination not seen since the height of the pandemic, many, including Canada's, are doing just that. Banding and banking together to rescue systemically important Credit Suisse in a sale to rival UBS. From public statements to big financial backing, it's all about confidence and reassurance that this won't be 2008 all over again. The euro area banking sector is resilient, with strong capital and liquidity positions. What regulators are worried about right now is that crisis of faith in the banking system becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, where even healthy banks might fail. Signs of trouble abound, though banks around the world are in much better shape than they were in the lead up to the 08 crisis. But even fears of a financial contagion alone could cause chaos. Some analysts now see more similarities between what's unfolding and the savings and loan crisis in the United States. Between 1986 and 1995, 1,300 financial institutions failed, or roughly a third of existing savings and loans associations, known as thrifts, south of the border. It came at a high cost to banks that survived, as well as taxpayers. Back in the 1980s, that was a period of high inflation, high commodity prices, of volatility, and, and central banks were, were rapidly hiking interest rates. Canada's banks are well capitalized, diversified, and tightly regulated. Many experts say even if your portfolio has taken a short-term hit, it's not necessarily time to make drastic changes. I've got my money I'm a, in, in my portfolio. I haven't touched it. I'm a long-term investor. What all of this means for central banks' ability to fight inflation with monetary policy is unclear. Tuesday, we'll get the latest consumer price index for Canada. And Wednesday, the U.S. Federal Reserve will announce what it's doing with its key interest rate, the expectation is a modest 25 basis point hike as it treads carefully during this time of great uncertainty.
Donna. Okay, Anne Gaviola in Toronto, thank you. Now to Montreal, where the mayor wants a crackdown on illegal Airbnb rentals after a fire in a heritage building in Old Montreal. One body has been found and six people are still missing. And I'm calling him to do his job, to uh, forbid any type of renters who do not respect the law. Airbnb Canada cannot just say, oh, well, we did what we had to do. It's not true. And what is happening in Montreal happens in the other places in Quebec and in Canada. Police confirmed today the body of a woman was recovered Sunday evening. The three-story heritage building housed 15 units, both long- and short-term rentals, including Airbnbs, which are illegal in that area of Old Montreal. The mayor wants more inspectors and greater collaboration between Airbnb and the province to ensure landlords comply with the rules. Investigators are still searching for six people who are unaccounted for. They're believed to be from Quebec, Ontario and the U.S. Police in Quebec have confirmed a third person has now died after the driver of a pickup truck hit pedestrians in the small town of Amqui last week. A 41-year-old man died in the hospital over the weekend. Two other men, aged 65 and 73, also died after they were struck on a crowded sidewalk last Monday. Eight others were injured. One of them is still in critical condition. The driver, a 38-year-old man, has been charged with two counts of dangerous driving causing death. And police say more charges are pending. Coming up, what could happen if Donald Trump is arrested this week? Plus, bittersweet birthday the family of actor Bruce Willis on dealing with dementia. Former American President Donald Trump says he thinks he'll be arrested tomorrow in a criminal case involving hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. New York prosecutors have not confirmed anything, but Trump has succeeded in rallying his supporters who have rushed to his defense. Jackson Prosco reports from Manhattan. There is no playbook for a moment like this. Should Donald Trump be indicted and arrested, he will appear inside this lower Manhattan courthouse for arraignment, becoming the first former president charged with a crime. I would expect that the DA at this point pretty much has almost all the information he needs. I think he's probably presented the bulk, uh, if not everything he intends to present to the grand jury, and he's ready to make a decision and move ahead. Security was tight as the grand jury worked away Monday, hearing testimony from Robert Costello, a Trump ally who sought to discredit Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen. Cohen is the central figure in the alleged hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels, who claimed she had an affair with Trump. Ultimately, prosecutors may charge Trump with a felony if they believe he falsified business information for the purposes of concealing another crime. He will have to go through all of the normal procedures that any defendant who is charged in federal criminal court or state criminal court has to go through, including having a mugshot taken. Over the weekend, Trump speculated his arrest could come as soon as Tuesday. He called for protests in the streets. Republicans were quick to claim political persecution, but called on supporters to stay calm. We want calmness out there. Nobody Nobody per violence or harm to anything else. The Manhattan case is viewed as a test of whether a former president is above the law. It's also the least of Trump's legal troubles. He still faces probes into election interference in Georgia, the January 6th attack, and the mishandling of classified documents. I am convinced he's going to be indicted in New York and in Georgia and at the federal level for the Mar-a-Lago documents matter. But as far as what happens next, that's a big question. This is uncharted territory for us in the United States. And Jackson joins me uh, from Manhattan. Jackson, we know security is tight. The NYPD are on alert. Are there specific threats being made? Donna, it's not so much specific threats at this point, but a broader concern about how Trump supporters may react if, in fact, he's indicted. We saw security stepped up outside the courthouse here today. Back in Washington, multiple law enforcement agencies have been meeting throughout the day to figure out a game plan for any possible unrest. And the district attorney here in New York has put out a pretty forceful statement saying that threats and intimidation against his staff will not be tolerated. Donna? All right, Jackson. All right, Jackson, in New York City tonight, thanks. Diagnosis debate ahead. What's the best way to screen for gestational diabetes?
The family of actor Bruce Willis is celebrating his 68th birthday and being brutally honest about dealing with his dementia diagnosis. He has frontal temporal dementia, which progresses quickly. There's no cure. His ex-wife, Demi Moore, tweeted this video celebrating along with their daughters and other family. She says she's thankful for all the love and warm wishes. Willis's current wife, Emma Hemming Willis, shared her thoughts on Instagram. She says people are always commending her for being so strong, but admits she woke up crying and simply does what she has to do to keep her household and her life in order. I do have times of sadness every day. <laughs> grief every day um, and I'm really feeling it today um, on his birthday. The couple married in 2009. They have two young daughters. Hemming Willis posted this reel for his birthday even though she says it was difficult. I know how much you love my husband and don't cry Emma <laughs> but it means so much to me so thank you. She and the family say they're doing what they can to help Willis live as full a life as possible. Well, gestational diabetes can lead to serious complications during pregnancy if it's not managed properly. A study out of BC published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal looked at more than 550,000 pregnancies in that province between 2005 and 2019. During that time, rates of gestational diabetes doubled from 7.2% to 14.7%. A change in screening methods is partly why, and as Catherine Ward explains, there's a debate underway about how best to test for the condition. What we do know is that the rate of gestational diabetes in BC is way higher than the rest of the country. It's an outlier. An outlier, but not necessarily a surprise for study author Elizabeth Nethery. We found that that change in screening practice has really led to the uh, almost doubling of gestational diabetes cases in British Columbia. In general, there are two ways patients in Canada are screened for gestational diabetes. They're commonly referred to as the two-step approach and the one-step method. The two-step involves having a sugary drink and then having blood work done an hour later. And if they're in the in-between uh, zone, then they go in to have a second sugary drink that checks actually three different blood sugars. The one-step method goes straight to the more detailed round of testing. While the one-step approach diagnoses a lot more diabetes, uh, it doesn't actually improve outcomes at a population level. There is debate amongst doctors and policymakers over which tests to use. Diabetes Canada recommends the phased approach. Well, higher sugars lead to more complications, lower sugars lead to less compli complications. But what no one can really agree on is where we draw that line, because there is no kind of cut point that is very obvious. Gestational diabetes is a resource intensive condition. About a third of people will need to start insulin, which is an injected medication. We're more likely to medicalize pregnancy, um, which can be a problem for, for many pregnant people. Researchers say more analysis needs to be done. But it may also be kind of putting more people into this box of a, of a medical condition, a significant medical condition during pregnancy, um, in, in some cases, um, to limited or, or less benefit. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Pride night next, the challenges the NHL has faced promoting inclusivity. The NHL is not really known for its progressive thinking and inclusiveness, and there was a reminder of that over the weekend. The goaltender for the San Jose Sharks, a guy from a small town in Manitoba, was the only player on his team to refuse to wear a rainbow-themed jersey on Pride Night. Three other teams, the Wild, the Rangers and the Islanders, scrapped plans to wear Pride uniforms altogether. Mike Armstrong reports on how hockey has changed and how, in some ways, it has not. The team's had a lot of fun out there. This is the part of the San Jose Sharks Pride weekend that went off without a hitch. The team's office staff played a game against the San Francisco Earthquakes, a local LGBTQ2 hockey team. The Sharks head coach was behind the bench for the Earthquakes. It was a great experience, obviously. Uh, they're very passionate about hockey. Now, another part of the weekend's special programming came before Saturday night's game. The Sharks took the warm-up skate wearing Pride jerseys designed by a local artist. 
As a kid, I didn't think I was able to be an artist. Um, and then also as a kid, I knew I was queer, but I was too afraid to say anything. Of the 20 Sharks players set to suit up, one stayed in the locker room. The team tweeted a statement for goaltender James Reimer. The 13-year veteran said he wouldn't participate because wearing the jersey would mean endorsing, quote, something that is counter to my personal convictions, which are based on the Bible. Loving puppies doesn't get 100% participation, right? Kurt Weaver is with the You Can Play Project, a group that fights homophobia in sports. He says Reimer's decision is disappointing, but suggests focusing instead on the Sharks players who did wear the jersey and the players around the league who've supported pride efforts. One player with a bit of rainbow tape on a stick 12 years ago would have been a story on the front page of every sporting place because it just wasn't done. And now the story is that all but one. And I think that's, you know, we'll, we'll take it. To me, it's like a selfish move. Reimer is facing uh, some criticism for his decision, but there are also supporters. We need more people like James Reimer standing up for what they believe in. When major League athletes in any sport refuse to participate in gay rights initiatives. There are some who take advantage of the occasion. Good job, James. There are people out there that appreciate the position that you are taking right now. It is going to empower. Weaver admits there is almost always some blowback, but says overall there is progress. The people he feels sorry for after Saturday's game, he says, are the staff in the Sharks organization who worked on the Pride weekend and saw their efforts overshadowed. Credit to San Jose, because they really, really killed it that night. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. It is the spring equinox, the first day of spring. So tonight's your Canada. Are these crocuses emerging in North Vancouver and full confession I actually took these pictures now I know I know not everyone in Canada has flowers blooming yet I hope this gives you some hope because spring is here please email your Canada to viewers at globalnational.com and thanks for watching hope to see you here again tomorrow bye bye